Great. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for joining this evening's webinar, uh, all about the importance of diversity on farms. We are yeah, very pleased to be joined by Shane New of Understanding Ag and Ian Gold. Uh, Shane is one of the partners of Understanding Ag, that is a group of uh, regenerative farmers that have helped over 30 million acres of farmland transition to regenerative agriculture. And he's joined by Ian Gold, who is one of the founders of Oak Bank, that, are, that also specialise in advice to regenerative farms. Uh, Ian is, uh, has particular interest in, uh, in, in companion crops and cover crops, and uh, I think he'll be imparting some of his knowledge to us this evening. So yeah, thanks very much to you both for, for joining. Uh, just before I pass over to, to them both, I just wanted to touch very briefly on Regenerate Outcomes and who we are. Regenerate Outcomes supports farms to improve soil health through a mentoring program uh, with the experienced regenerative farmers at Understanding Ag. Understanding Ag gets to know the farms uh, through a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings, get to understand their, get their context and what, what they want to achieve from, from their farming and then provide advice and and uh, and share tips to improve health and uh, and ultimately improve farm resilience and, and profitability. We also baseline and monitor the uh, environmental benefits that come from a more regenerative system uh, and we do this to generate new revenue streams for farms. Uh, for more information please have a look at our website I will I'll pop our, our website address uh, in the chat now. Uh, but uh, but yeah, on that note, I will I'll pass over to Shane. And I, I should say, if you have any questions during the presentation, please pop them in the Q and A section, and then uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to them after uh, Shane and Ian have, have chatted. But yeah, thanks very much, and, and over to Shane. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to provide some information tonight, <clears throat> hopefully in regards to diversity, and more specifically, diversity. How do we add diversity back into you know, annual annual cropping systems. So as mentioned, I am one of the partners in Understanding Ag and I'm joined by some of my colleagues here this evening from Understanding Ag. So hopefully we can address maybe any questions myself, Ian, or some of the other consultants can help address maybe the questions you have after the presentation. So tonight's topic is about diversity. So before we really go a lot deeper into diversity, <clears throat> I want to emphasize the importance of it. You know, in the six, three, four, so the six principles of soil health, the three rules of adaptive stewardship, and the four ecosystem processes, it's the one item that is included in all of these. And we'll go through these real quick. In our principles, the six principles, you can see context, minimal to no soil dis disturbance, armor on the soil surface, living root as long as possible, the number five diversity, followed by animal impact. When we look at the rules of adaptive stewardship, you can see we have compounding cascading effects, disruptions, and diversity again. It's the six principles and the three rules are what drive the four ecosystem processes. And the ecosystem processes are the energy cycle, the water cycle, mineral cycle, and community of dynamics or diversity. So diversity plays a key role in all systems. So why is diversity important? You know, that's a question we're kind of addressing this evening, and we're going to be visiting and talking more about, and how to introduce diversity. So the way I like to think of diversity is think of your own local community. You know, like the community I live in, you know, the only way that community is productive or a community is productive is if we have diversity. You know, think of diversity being skills and knowledge. You know, in order for a community to be successful, you know, we need carpenters, we need welders, we need doctors, we need plumbers, we need electricians. <clears throat> Those are skills and also knowledge that make communities diversity 
are those skills and knowledge which makes communities successful. It's no different in plant communities. In this particular photo that I'm showing, and I hope you can see my cursor, but this is just a perennial grassland. And what I want to try to identify here is there's cool seasons grasses growing. This taller, larger grass, this is a warm season grass. You can also capture there's a lot of diversity of Forbes flowers within the system. And it's all functioning and working together. There's another great example of diversity of plant communities. This was taken in the Sand Hills in Nebraska. But look at how healthy, how vibrant everything looks in this photo. But what I want you to capture more specifically is look at the diversity that you can witness here. We have a lot of orbs. We have lead plant with the purple flowers on it. We have sunflowers. We have grass species. And there's a tremendous amount of diversity. But look at how this diversity is functioning within this community. You know, one of the important parts of diversity is when we think about, or I think about diversity, is, is how well is that diversity capturing energy for me? And when I'm talking about energy, I'm talking about sunlight. And what kind of architecture or leaf structures do I have out there? That diversity capturing that energy. You know, one thing I think we, we don't think about in production agriculture well enough is we have leaky systems. And we want to be able to capture all the energy we can. You know, you should think of your farm and ranch as a power plant. And like any power plant, you want to maximize the output from it. Well, the way I try to maximize output from my farm and ranch here in Kansas is to implement diversity into the system of plants. But really look at the above ground caption here of the different architecture of leaves. But look how that reflects down the soil itself of the diversity of different root architectures and how that different root architecture affects things in different ways itself. So this is just a great photo I captured here about a month ago. You know, this is a little bit of diversity put into a cover crop mix of plants. You can see the sunflower there that's that's in the center of your screen. But I really want you to witness here in this photo is look how this little bit of diversity has attracted more diversity. Now we're talking plant communities, but look at how it's starting to attract insect communities. There's three different types of bees on this particular sunflower. So diversity starts building compounding systems. As you can see here, there's a ladybug there at the top of the screen. You know, that diversity from that past crop, the residue on the ground, but there's also diversity of plants following the, following the harvest of this production crop being grown. So, but it attracts and provides a habitat for beneficial organisms such as the ladybugs, gives them a means to, to protect themselves and also a place to feed. So as I mentioned, we need to think about our farms and ranches as power plants, energy systems. And I want to maximize the amount of energy that I can capture. And the way I do that is through the diversity of plant species. Are the different architecture leaves, root systems, capture as much sunlight as I can possibly capture. Again, take a look at this caption. Think about that sun photo there. Look at the images of the, of the plants growing out there and think of how much energy is being leaked from that particular image, that photo. Very little energy is being leaked but it's through diversity of plants. And you can see that as I represent again, the different leaf structures of the diversity of plants. With that different leaf structure and canopy, you know, it also helps break as we get, receive rain, especially here in the Midwest where we get heavy thunderstorms, 
you know, a raindrop's coming down at a significant amount of speed, rate of speed, coming hitting the ground. But if I have different leaf architectures, structures out there, it helps break that leaf, excuse me, break that rain droplet up, rain droplet up to help slow down that, that energy. So diversity plays many, many key, key roles. Also think about capturing the carbon, how diversity can play a role in that. And the big reason for diversity, definitely in a lot of our systems, is I want diversity of different plants capturing sunlight, water, and carbon, and leaking root exudates out into the soil. This is probably a very impactful image. I don't know how many have witnessed this before, but I just find this fascinating. But how nature is taking that energy, sunlight, water, and carbon, and leaking carbon back into the system. And how this leads to more diversity. Because the plants are the ones that are attracting the soil microbiology. It's through the diversity of plant species providing different root exudates to attract the soil microbiome, the soil microbiology. This is just an image that I captured. This is one view underneath the microscope at 400 magnification. But look at all the life, all the diversity of life, microbiology within this, with this particular photo. So as we add plant diversity above ground, it helps attract microbe diversity within the soil. And one particular species, you know, we'd like to talk a lot about is mycorrhizal. You know, diversity, mycorrhizal has association with a lot of different plant species, especially our grasses and some of our legumes. Now, mycorrhizal does not make a strong association with a lot of our brassicas. So as we add diversity, we want to help propagate mycorrhizal expansion within our systems. And diversity also helps lead to succession or larger organisms to, to benefit into the soil system, such as earthworms. And really the foundation of what we're trying to get accomplished here is how do we take diversity and the function of diversity to capture more energy to start building soil aggregation? You know, it takes that diversity. Think about it when a plant goes to, to pollination. That plant is no longer providing root exudates into the soil. But if I have another different leaf, excuse me, another plant in there, that's starting to grow, who's starting to provide carbon exudates into the soil, is helping feed soil microbiology. So we keep soil aggregation constantly occurring. You know, our soil should look nice and aggregated within our soils. And once we build a soil aggregate, we're just not done. These soil aggregates last for about 21 to 28 days. So if we're just growing a monocultured plant out there, we may have an opportunity to build some soil aggregation, but once that plant goes to maturity, it's no longer feeding root exudates into the soil, helping feed soil microbiology and help with the continuation of aggregation. So what's the unintended consequence if we're not building soil aggregation? Well, one of the unintended consequences if we're not building good soil aggregation is we're not having a very effective water cycle. And if we don't have a very effective water cycle, we're not having a very effective nutrient cycle. So we want to try to, how do we keep providing exudates with diversity of plant species into our cropping systems? So here's just a good example. This is a warm season cash crop corn that was harvested. And you can see there's a cover crop, a diversity of cover crop that was planted afterwards. 
But once you really notice here along these rhizosheaths sheets of these roots, look at all the silt, sands, and clays that are being adhered to this root, this fibrous root. Think of all the biology that's being fed along this fibrous root. Now, obviously, the corn crop has long been harvested. We have diversity of cover crops planted in between the rows of the corn crop but it's capturing energy, which is providing carbon back into the soil, feeding the biology, which is helping build soil aggregation, feeding the diversity of soil microbes within the soil. Here's just a good example of how we use warm season cover crops while in the cool season, cash crops such as wheat. For capturing energy, sunlight, water and carbon, leaking root exudates into the soil, feeding the soil microbiology, the microbiology starting to build the micro and macro aggregate. We're constantly wanting to capture energy with diversity of plant species. So I was in Europe last year, and like this particular photo was taken in Ireland. But this is where some diverse cover crops were planted. This would have been in October of last year, but I found it extraordinarily amazing, and so did a lot of the attendees, of how much diversity was out there. But that diversity, how it attracted a lot of insect species, some wildlife species were attracted to this particular area, but this particular farmer was starting to no-till into his diverse cover crop. But think about this. Just look at this photo here. How much energy was being leaked from this system? Very little sunlight was hitting the soil surface. It was being captured by the leaves of these plants, the diverse leaves, diversity of the leaves, and helping provide carbon back in the soil, helping feed the soil microbiology. This is just another great example of adding diversity. This is a nut orchard in California, where they planted a diverse cover crop mix between the rows of trees. But notice how well, how vibrant it looks. One thing that was captured by all the attendees of the school was, was the amount of insect activity. The biological activity was occurring in the soil. If you notice this individual right here, he was smelling the soil, how fresh it smelled, how healthy it smelled. It's these communities get developed with the association of diversity of plant species. This is just a good example. In South Central Kansas, they've been dealing with D4 drought now for the last couple of years. This is a warm season cover crop that was planted late May, early June. What I really want to emphasize here is they're in a drought. They've received very, very little moisture. And even though this biomass doesn't look extraordinary, there is still a significant amount of biomass on very limited moisture that's being grown. But the diversity that was added in the mix, you can see how some plants did very well, such as this sun hemp, the plants with the yellow flowers, versus some of the grass species, how it, how it was able to thrive even in drought conditions. But it's association with the diversity, these plant communities working together. So sun hemp is a legume. Obviously, our grass species are here. So they're working in association together. Here's another great example. The same area, same type of region in South Central Kansas. You can notice we have some diversity within this system. There's some sunflowers. There's grass species. And as I mentioned earlier, these guys are dealing with drought, a very severe drought region. But it's how these communities work and function together. You know, this doesn't look significant, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of biomass, but, but how much energy is really hitting the soil surface? It's being captured with leaves, the diversity of leaf structures. Here's another great image 
from western Kansas. This is post weed harvest. Now they did receive a little bit of moisture once weed harvest was was over in mid to late June of this year. But we planted a very diverse cover crop mix post weed harvest. And they did receive a little bit of moisture in order for the cover crop to express itself very, very well. But look at the image in the background here. How much energy is being lost? It's hard to tell in this particular photo the diversity, but there was some legumes, grasses within this mix. But look how well it functioned. This is without any nutrient application. Obviously, this farmer, we're learning how to also manage, manage diversity. He built a roller crimper to lay this cover crop down in order to start planting wheat into it and using it as a means, hopefully as a termination means. And this is an image from that same particular field just last week. Now, since the roller termination occurred until this photo, they've only had one inch of moisture. But that diversity also helped build a lot of biomass, which we were able to lay down to protect the soil to build soil armor, which is now helping the next production crop. So it's helping keep moisture from evaporating, which is allowing the next production crop to start, to start growing very, very well on very limited moisture. Now I just want to show, here's an example of the wheat plant that's currently growing in that field. Look at how those rhizosheaths, sheaths, those roots are engulfed with silt, sands, and clays. You know, this is being done, accomplished by the soil microbiology. That's also that living root feeding the soil microbiome. Diversity of plants. You know, constantly we want to keep capturing as diversity every time we get an opportunity. The top right here, we're growing a monoculture of soybeans, but we came in aerially with a plane and we seeded cool season cover crops into this soybean field. So we're trying to add some diversity at this moment in time. We've added some little bit of grasses and some brassicas. But as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to leak any energy. I want to capture all the energy that I can. The bottom right photo here where my cursor is, it's some legumes, red clover, being grown with some triticale. But what you want you to witness here is how much energy is hitting the soil surface. It's being captured by a leaf structure. There was also some crimson clover in this mix. You know, diversity, I find, is, is fascinating. You know, one thing we're able to witness on our own farm is how diversity starts building upon itself. And these particular photos here are just some images of some of the wildflowers we're starting to capture back within our system. But the way I look at it is, look at the diverse plant species, plants now that are producing different root exudates to feed different soil microbiology. But not only that, it's now diversity of plants that my livestock are able to utilize within their diets and how it attracts different diversity of insect species and how these plants also help attract different species of wildlife. Here's just an example that I just took here. This was some warm season, a very diverse warm season cover crop that we grazed. After we were finished grazing, we were immediately back in, no tilling back in. A very, not a very diverse, but a small diversity mix of cool season grasses. Trying to capture energy, trying to keep fighting root exudates into the soil to help build it soil aggregation. This is just an example of a root from that particular area that was washed off. Look at the amount of, amount of fibrous roots that are engulfed there. 
you know, well, look at that. Look at all that root system that is pumping carbon back into the soil. That's helping feed soil microbiology. That's helping build more diversity of soil microbiology within my systems, which is helping me with a better nutrient cycle. So it helps limit the amount of synthetic nutrients that I need to buy and purchase. You know, one thing we don't talk enough about, and probably I haven't mentioned it well enough to this point, is how adding diversity can also help us in other, other aspects. You know, this is a this is a corn crop that was harvested. Once the corn crop was harvested, we planted a cool season cover crops with a little bit of legume component into it. But this diversity is also helping us go after a lot of excess soluble nutrients that we able to capture in the next in the biomass of of the cover crop that we can utilize next spring in our production systems. So think about diversity is how can I add as much diversity into my system as I possibly can? When are my windows of opportunity to add diversity? You know, you have to put things within your context. You know, our context here in Kansas is we're able to add diversity post a cool season grain harvest, such as wheat, triticale, barley, where I can add a tremendous amount of diversity because of my growing season. When it comes into the fall of the year, when soil temperatures start to cool off, day length gets shorter. You know, we may have to limit the amount of diversity that I can plant just for those reasons. We also have to be thinking ahead. What's the next production crop do I want to grow? How much diversity can I put ahead of it? Is that diversity going to cause me issues in growing the next production crop? So we're always challenged in thinking about how do we manage it? How do we take care of it? And where can we add the diversity? And when are my windows of opportunity to throw the most amount of diversity into a system? Another way I look at the diversity, you know, in my part of the world here, it was estimated there was about 220 plant species per acre being grown. Most of our systems are limited to a monoculture for 12 months out of the year. You know, so a very limited amount of diversity being implemented. So just to add by adding four or five new plant species into that system, think of how many years, if not decades, it's been since the soil, the soil microbiology, has seen that kind of diversity. And how can I build upon that? I think to myself, is that going to be compounding or cascading? And hopefully it's compounding, it's building within our systems. Ian, do you have any comments or thoughts? Yes, certainly. Um, I think the one thing I try and do when I'm thinking about diversity is you know, what what's the goal? It, it's uh, it, it's true that it's generally a helpful thing, but um, it's really what you're trying to achieve. And and sometimes um, some diversity rather than lots of it can actually work better in a whole system. Um, I've got got some examples of that in uh, in the presentation. Do you want me to to put mine up or uh, is yours? Yes. Yeah. I'll take mine down here. Allow you to. Share okay. yours. Let's see if I can do that. Hang on. How's this work? Share screen. I think you, Shane, you need to stop sharing and then uh, sorry, Ian will, will be able to pop up. Uh, you might have to help me here, Jake. Just top, just scroll right, just to the left of the red button. The next one across there. there. Click that. I got it. Perfect. All right, let's see if I can. Are you there? Yeah, we see we see you in. We see you. OK, fantastic. Right. I've not not done this on my iPad before, but um, so I'm I'm just I mean, I agree certainly with a lot of what's been said already about the importance of it and i'm just trying to sort of put it into a 
a UK context for people. So just going on to my point just now that, you know, we've got to think about what we're trying to achieve. And um, I, I fundamentally believe that the only thing that creates soil structure is biology. And the more biology that we have of different sorts, the more uh, organic compounds and things like glomalin and so on that's coming to help create that aggregate structure. And we create this sort of chocolate cake look of, of the soil. You know, the, the, the sample on, the, on the, the left of your screen is clearly what people would prefer to the one on the right, which is very compacted and there's, there's no air, there's no ability for water to get through it and so on and so forth. So all that structure is created by biology. Metal simply moves it around. And um, certainly seen with my own eyes in, in the UK that the more biology and the more diversity we can get into mixtures, whether that's in an arable rotation or through things like um, herbal lays in a, in a grazing situation, um, the more diversity we can get in, the faster these changes happen. And yeah, to me, I've come to realise that um, you know, diversity really equals resilience. And that's what we're trying to build into the system, whether that be resilience in your soil or diversity of cropping, because you know, for lots of reasons and, and many of them just simply economic, the, the diversity in our cropping system has become less and less and less. And you know, many arable farmers would say the only one they really make any money out of is wheat. So they're trying to do that as, as much as they possibly can. And that is in danger of actually reducing the diversity even further. But you know, certainly in Cambridgeshire, where I live, it was very common for people to grow wheat, rape, wheat, rape, you know, in, in rotation. And we've all seen the, the problems that that can cause. So to me, you know, diversity builds in resilience. And, um, you know, what does diversity look like? What do you think of it when, when you're thinking about that word? Um, and to me, it comes in a number of different forms, whether that be in terms of really sort of widely diverse multi-species cover crop, like the picture on the left, uh, whether you're looking at something like a, a multi-crop where you're growing more than one crop to take to harvest, uh, such as things like oats and beans. Um, and you know, people like Ben Adams are doing a lot of work, which is in a lot of cross social media at the moment where you can see how he's getting on with that. And then you've got you know, even more diversity in things like grazing mixtures, uh, in some of the stewardship and SFI options and so on. But diversity can also extend to other things. So, you know, simply bringing livestock back into arable systems, I think is, is a real plus if you can do it. Clearly there has to be infrastructure, there needs to be uh, people that know what they're doing. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to mean you, you need to have them on your staff. You can, you can bring them in. People are doing these flying flocks of sheep and so on, certainly in East Anglia. But getting all this diversity back into your system, I've seen it for myself, it, it certainly speeds up the changes that you're seeing in the soil. And that's really what, what we're trying to achieve with, you know, building soil carbon and building that resilience back in. So whether or not the, the cattle, like the top, top left, are just eating and terminating a, a multi-species cover crop, whether you've got pigs, you know, feeding on your grass and, and perhaps in woodland and so on whether it's cattle feeding on a multi-species sward rather than uh, just a ryegrass mixture and again whether you're able to bring in sheep temporarily using electric fencing and so on to kill off um, the cover crop. <laughs> so really to sort of add that UK context, clearly our country is considerably smaller than somewhere like the USA but we still have significant geographic differences between the north and the south and, and the east and the west, whether that be when your harvest date is, what the weather's likely to be like. Um, the harvest date obviously impacts the differences between, the, sorry, the time distances between when your crop is harvested and when the next one goes in. And there'll be regional differences of what's sort of typically found on farms. You know, certainly have been to areas in the east where you know livestock facilities are, are few and far between and equally in the west where arable facilities are few and far between but there are usually um, contractors and things available you know not too far away. Soil types can vary massively you know from field to field and even within fields with the size of some of them and certainly from region to region and that can make, make a big difference about what's really possible. The types of farm you know and you know 
the specialization that's happened um you know lo lots of experts have have said you know double down on your what you do you specialize and you know increase the the number of animals on on a particular piece of ground which has caused problems and all, all kinds of things which seem to make sense at the time but they've had perhaps unintended consequences but the availability of livestock in the east is has always been a reason that people say oh no we can't get them grazed off but certainly where you have that's been been a real plus so really the common places to start in the uk for farmers have been with things like um, companion crops, particularly with oilseed rape, but increasingly uh, in other crops like, like wheat and so on, or with mixtures like these multi-species herb, herbal lays, either through stewardship or, or outside of that. And you know they've been terrific for both soil health and animal health with things like natural wormers and things like chicory, but the deep rooting species, you know, the, leg, the lucerns, the chicories, the plantains, those sorts of things. They've they've really built soil. I mean, this this thing that soil takes a thousand years to create an inch of soil. We're certainly seeing that that's not even remotely true. Um, we're turning what what could reasonably call be called dirt to use one of Gabe's favourite expressions, but you know it's turning dirt back into soil, um, no question. And and relatively quickly within you know a three to five year time span, we've seen significant changes in how um, soil behaves more like soil and and less like dirt. Um, and particularly in things like water. Another way people are looking at doing it more and bringing diversity in, and yeah, this, this is where, you know, what do we mean by diversity? Because this is only one other species in the field. So we, we've, we've included white clover as a single species crop, either sowing it within a winter oil seed rape crop or establishing it and then sowing winter wheat into it. And it would be lovely to put more legumes in different sorts, you know, a variety of things in. But this particular one has the advantage that it is tolerant of glyphosate up to, up to a point. Um, it stays nice and small in the bottom of the crop. It doesn't misbehave. And, um, you know, it seems to work really well in the system where we've tried other things. Um, they either don't persist or they start to become a problem. So, you know, it's appropriate diversity. And this is still 100 percent more diversity than was there before. So, you know, the idea that you have to use 20 species to create this diversity isn't always the case. Um, you know, better is still better. It might not be perfect. Um, but, you know, typically this is what we see on UK arable farms in terms of a diverse mix. You know, anywhere between three, six, eight species, um, commonly stuff like um, linseed, buckwheat, phacelia, uh, bursine clover, vetches sunflowers, um, oats, rye, those kind of things. So they, they'd be becoming very typical and, and you know, things that people are, you know, don't think of as quite so bizarre anymore. And um, they're doing a really nice job, even in a relatively short space of time between um, harvest and autumn establishment, um, you know, getting those diversity of roots. And you, you see here some of the, the riser sheaths forming on these different types of plants, you've got clover, buckwheat, cereal, vetches and, and farber beans, um, you know, these sorts of things, many of which can be grown on the farm. You know, the, the bean, I, I'd strongly suggest if you're looking to do this at scale, growing some seeds yourself is a really good idea and it, it helps to keep the cost down. So things like oats, linseed, beans and so on, you know, relatively straightforward to grow. You know how to do it and um, they can be done. But probably things like phacelia and so on, you need so little by comparison to your area that you're probably better off still buying in those things and mixing them with the bulk straights from the farm. But um, you know, they can really, really help to get those diversity of species up. So when, I, when I'm thinking about you know, a really good multi-species crop, this is the kind of thing I'm thinking of. You know, it's got obviously got some peas, some phacelia, some, some brassicas. There's some cereal in there. There's some you know, warm season things like millet, sorghum, and probably some sunflowers in the mix. But you know, really diverse. But you you almost have to see this for yourself on your own farm to see what it will do to your soil. It, it's absolutely remarkable at how quickly it can really change things. Um, and then going on to sort of how people are, are dealing with it. Um, a bit, bit like one of Shane's photographs, drilling green is certainly something that we see very very successful in the autumn. I have to be honest, I see it being less successful with things like spring cereals. Um, but, you know, perhaps that's because we don't know how, quite how to do it yet. 
but in the autumn, you know, drilling into a really quite a thick, tall cover crop with particularly with a disc drill, something like a, a sky drill or, a, or an avatar, something like that. Um, my experience of it is it, it seems to work better with a disc drill and it does a tine. Uh, the tine drills seem to snag up with some of the bigger cover crops. If you've got a relatively small one, it, it might work better. Um, not too much experience with the crimper rollers here yet. Some people um, certainly have tried um, and people have been out on a on a cold frost in January with a Cambridge roll, which is a, a ridged roller. Um, that's been very effective at you know, killing off the cover crop. Um, but we have to face it, most people are still using glyphosate uh, because none of those techniques, you know, grazing and, and crimping and that sort, they just do not deal with grass weeds, which are one of our biggest problems. You know, going back to the context of this, uh, glyphosate really is an essential tool for many farmers here. Um, and, you know, I don't see us getting away from that in the next few years. Um, but certainly where we've done this and we've got the, the crops drilled into these cover crops, we're seeing really good results with little little slug damage. And, you know, it certainly has suppressed the, the black grass emergence because there just hasn't been any light or you know space for that to grow. So it's certainly not killing the grass weeds off, but it is taking the space away from them. And we're also seeing, you know, typically a nitrogen requirement. If you've got the crop grown reasonably well, you know, something 30 to 40 kilos of nitrogen less needed to be applied um, with these sorts of crops. So just really leave you with a, a sort of closing thought. So everyone's like, oh, it's not the right time. It's not this, it's not that. There really isn't a right time. There just is time and what you choose to do with it. And, you know, certainly a lot of people have put the put the time in for you so far and you don't need to make the same sort of let's call them rookie errors and mistakes that people have made in the past. You know, learn from that and um, be successful as you move forward. Stop share. How do I stop sharing? Stop presenting. There we go. We got you back. Yep. So, so I see uh, I see a question uh, in the chat um, from Chris Parkins. He says um, that he's having year on year crop failure. Um, when it comes to planting cover crops, um, at best 25 to 30 percent cover crop establishment uh, with even 11 way mixes failing. And if Shane or Ian, you could comment on that. So I guess I'd like a little more clarification. He said he's planting 11 way mix, he's having cover crop failure. So I guess more specifically, you know. There's times we'll put species in a mix where it may it may actively grow at the very beginning, but then it becomes outcompeted by other species. I mean, if he's referring to that, I don't look at that as a failure. I look as that plant had an opportunity to take off, start growing. It's providing some new root exudates into the soil, and it may get outcompeted, but it did its job for a, a specific amount of time. If I know I've got plant species in that mix, I may limit the amount of the plant species within the mix. I may not put a very high percentage of it in, but I still want to capture that window of opportunity for, for that plant to, pr to provide some new exudates into the soil to help cycle nutrients. Ian? Yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to confess to knowing Chris quite well. So. <laughs> Um, he has got a, a quite a tricky site. Um, it's fairly heavy soil just north of London. Um, yeah, it, it is a it is a frustration that um, you know I know how much time and effort he puts into it, and um, you know he, he has re really struggled to get this stuff going on on that heavy soil, and um, you know it's something that we'll certainly try and help him Im improve as we move forward. But um, you know. I hear some people saying that um, you, know, you put lots of species in in case some of them don't grow, some of them do. And that that might be the case when you first start off that, you know, you're not quite sure what's going to do well. But um, 
in the long run, you don't want to be wasting money on things that are not suited to your situation or, you know, or maybe create other problems. But I'm not sure that that's the case in, in Chris's situation. Um, you know, and we need to need to sort of dig further into it and find out quite what's going on there. Thanks, Blake. Yeah, Jake, Jake, can you hear me? Can you hear you, Luke? Yeah, loud and clear. OK, sorry. Sorry, I've had some issues there. I, I would agree with I think Ian's made some really good points, too, in this presentation. You know, sometimes just getting something started it doesn't have to be a big diverse mixture. It's just something to prime that system it would be a would be a benefit. Like I say, not knowing the full context, what what Chris is dealing with there as far as where he's at in the situation, just making sure that the, the proper species fit the context um, and don't always look at something as a failure. You know, getting something living, pumping some carbon into that system is going to be a benefit. It's just a matter of, you know, this this ship we're on that doesn't have power steering. Sometimes we got to just slowly keep the oars going to get that thing to start turning around. So maybe, you know, look at the seating uh, seats per square foot, seats per, per hectare that you're you're looking into there. Maybe we don't need to overwhelm the system with a whole bunch, but maybe just sprinkle in a little something just to get some diversity going. Might take you further in the long run. Just start start somewhere uh try not to look at it as failures find an opportunity for that if you know even though it is might like ian said maybe some heavy soil find an opportunity to to find some value with that uh quote unquote failure that you're calling that to salvage something out of that uh, but as i said maybe maybe reduce some seeding rates just to get something growing there if you're dealing with some wet heavy soils just getting some roots uh, established and gets uh prime in biology that way that's that's where i would attack that Great, thanks, Luke. Um, Ian, I've seen a, a, another question in the chat that's directed at you. I think Chris said that he's tried two-way up to 11-way mixes. Yeah, I'm, I mean, cer certainly. Um, I mean, it's a bit like Luke was saying, if you find, find something, I mean, I, I must admit, I try and I try and put more diversity in than perhaps would be typical or, or has, has been typical till recently. Um, one of our summer mixes would typically have eight or nine species in and, and something that goes in after harvest would probably have four or five and they'd be four or five different crop families. Um, I'm yet to try, well, certainly in an, in an arable annual cropping situation, you know, something like like Gabe talks about, we saw sort of 20 plus species. I, I must admit, I'd struggle to find 20 species that I could sensibly afford to put in in, in those scenarios. But we we certainly do that in in grazing crops. But, you know, the, the heavier the soil here, we, we tend to find the bigger seeds to do better. And where um, the soil is heavier and and you're maybe at the beginning of your transition to doing something with your soil, um, a time drill does seem to get better establishment than a than a disc drill. They just move that bit more soil. But the the reason a lot of people are, are moving towards you know looking at their soil health in the UK or certainly in in England in the arable areas is because of this weed called black grass. Um, and obviously, to try and stop that growing, you want to minimise the amount of soil movement, which is why people move to disc drills perhaps sometimes too soon. Um, and that can compromise how well the, the crop gets established. So, um, you know, it, it, it is a difficult thing to, to generalise about because every every situation is slightly different given um, rotations. And one of the other things that we're, you know, we're nowhere near knowledgeable enough about is the effect of herbicides that have been applied to the previous crop and the effect that has on the cover crop species. Um, some of them are absolutely desperately bad for months and months afterwards. Um, and we're only really just beginning to understand some of that. Um, so, you know, it's a combination of things. There isn't, there isn't, you know, I don't believe for a second there's something that Chris is doing wrong. It's just we need to, we need to get better at it across the system and um, and find out, you know, how how we get going and and dig into it a little bit deeper. But, you know, we, we see all sorts of problems and um, hopefully, as I say, as more people do this, we'll we'll ramp up the speed at which the learning takes place and we, we can hopefully apply that learning. That's that's where the sort of the Regenerate Outcomes program is so good in that you're, you're trying to help people through this. And um, 
you know, there's always there's a there's a price to pay for that learning, but you know, I think it's it's well worth it because I think the the goal that we're all aiming for is a really worthwhile one. Good point, Seth. Ian, and I, I'd also like to add, you, you brought up another point about, you know, the species as well. You know, here, um, you know, we're, we're still learning of this. The more we start to implement some of these practices, the more we figure out what we don't know about some species. But even here, just within the clover subspecies, you know, uh, crimson clover doesn't handle wet feet, but balanza clover does, you know, uh, here. So even in the same species, you know, I wouldn't plant an annual uh, or cereal or rye, grain rye, uh, um, in a wet system where I'd much rather have annual ryegrass, things like that. Understanding your species and their strengths and weaknesses of those might give you a little better success too. But I think you brought up a good point there, Ian, that there's some things that we just don't know about some species yet until we start getting it implemented out on some of these different scenarios. Good, good luck getting a British farmer to put ryegrass into an arable rotation. That's very, very unlikely to happen. <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard enough here. To, it's hard enough here too, because it, it can be a nightmare. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, Tom Pearson asks any comments on broadcasting into your patch crop before harvest. <clears throat> I'll comment my experience. Broadcasting, if you are going to broadcast, you may double your seed seeding rates. And, you know, we like to see moisture in the forecast prior to doing that. Uh, we've done a lot of aerial application in the past, flying the seed on. And if we don't get a rain pretty quickly afterwards, we have horrible results. I, myself personally, and I'll allow everybody else to inject their thoughts, I want that seed to soil contact if I can get it. I want it drilled in. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly say we've we've tried um, broadcasting with some you know very accurate machines that um, we have a a product here called Avidex that is a granule um, product that's applied uh, very accurately with with machines of quite a wide boom span. And we put seed through those machines. So obviously different seeds have different, what I call ballistic properties. They throw different rates, but this machine doesn't need to throw it very far. It almost drops it. And even where we've applied it really accurately in a season that would appear to be perfect, the, the success of broadcast crops into, into standing crops of wheat has been really patchy. You know, where where we thought it would be absolutely perfect, it's been really bad. And where we thought it would struggle, it's been OK. Um, and going back to the chemical thing, I wonder sometimes whether the the legacy effect of herbicides and so on is actually multiplied because we're not moving the soil. You know, if you're putting these um, pre-emergent and residual herbicides on the ground and then you're not moving the soil and then you're putting stuff onto the top of the soil where the chemical is, whether the, the effect is multiplied further um, and and maybe you know if you are going to you know we've see, certainly seen some research where people have um, done a very very shallow surface cultivation you know only a centimeter or so but the effect that that's had on things like slug eggs and um, cabbage stem flea beetle before rape and possibly herbicide residue um, has been quite significant so um, yeah there's a lot to learn but um, certainly where I can, I try and drill it because I get much better results more consistently and more even across the whole field. And that's really, for me, that's really important. I'd echo that seed to soil contact is is king and getting this. I mean, it's it's for as expensive as it is with the seed, you you want to have your best chance for success. So getting that seed to soil contact is key. Um, here, there's some aerial application in with airplanes and we we find we don't get very good stands anyway on the end rows and on those clay knobs and the rolling hills and that's where you really need establishment but we're just not getting in there i think the drones will help on the end rows uh but even then those those thin soil clay knobs things like that that we deal with around here um we need the living roots there and we're just not able to get them established through aerial application um there are some people doing some you know interceding it all depends on your context and what your goals are with that cover crop but i've had more success getting people to adjust crop maturities or add more diversity into that cash crop rotation to allow a better window of opportunity to get your next cover crop established.
Thanks both. Um, one from Kevin Birch, he says, I'm in my second year with herb and legume lays in my countryside stewardship and the crops are fantastic. Uh, the insect life is amazing. We've grazed and silaged them. It suits the farm at the moment to use graziers to eat them off. Is there any problem continuing with herb and legume lays and not following them with a cash crop such as wheat? I think the the productivity of them, depending depending slightly on um, the soil type, um, usually you'd expect a herbal lay to be productive for probably three to four years. Really, would be would be typical. Um, the, the thing is, the herbs and so on in them are these very deep rooting types. And what I found is on heavier clay soils that tend to lie wet, where the soil is wetter through the winter, those deep rooting species tend not to like that. They tend to get root diseases. Um, so take chicory, for example, on a heavy clay soil, we would normally see that lasting three to four years, but on a drier soil, a, a chalk or you know a Cotswold situation on more brashy land, it wouldn't be unusual to see that last eight, nine, ten years. So it is somewhat soil type specific, but you know you could certainly expect them to last three or four years. And it might be that you only need to top them up with some some more herbs and legumes. The grasses will probably be fine. Um, that how you do that can can vary a bit, but um, yeah, three or four years wouldn't be a problem. But but certainly those people who've been putting in the what we call it legume fallow um, which is in our countryside stewardship scheme which is similar to your conservation reserve program in the states um, you know, the people were hoping that that would be sort of a seamless transition between that and their wheat crops and and they are finding some problems with doing that um, but you know getting this more diversity in it's not a it's not a five minute fix it takes a bit of time but you know persevere and, and the benefits certainly are there but um, as we're all finding, mowing is no way to control black grass. Thanks, you know, on, on the subject of letter, you recommend. You're, you're on mute, Ian. Sorry, what, I, you broke up. I didn't catch what you were saying. Um, it was to do with uh, legume fallow and what seed mix do you recommend? Um, it varies a little bit, but if you're if you're talking about the code number in, in Britain is, is AB15 in our stewardship scheme. Um, if your motivation is to try and deal with black grass, I would urge you to use a mix that has got grass in it because there are some legume only options available. But what we find is they tend to get a bit thin and bare through the winter. And the thing that fills up the, the bare bits is it tends to be grass weeds. So if you've got grass in there as well, um, they, that tends to give a better sward density and, and thickness in the bottom. And that stops the, the black grass coming through so much. And, and one thing I would say, certainly where I've seen it work the best, it's, it's absolutely vital that you get the stuff sown early so that you get a really thick and good successful establishment in the autumn when in the year of establishment. If you go late, that crop never thickens up enough and you're bound to get more black grass coming in it. It's really crucial you get that stuff early. Um, I've got countless examples of that, you know, even on, I can think of one in Bedfordshire on the same field where it rained and then they were sort of three weeks later planting the second half of the field and, and it's like chalk and cheese. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy to speak to anyone specifically about their situation. But, um, you know, that's that's really the, the main difference is personally, if you've got black grass problems, if that's why you're taking the field out of rotation, I, I would certainly personally use a mix which has got grass in it for that reason. Great stuff. Thank you, Ian. If I may, Jake. Question. Go on, Kyle. Yeah, crack on. Yeah, um, we work with a Northumberland client um, and he's thinking about the AB15 and they don't have black grass pressure. What would you advise in that situation? And I believe he's in the chat as well, or so um, he might appreciate that. Sorry, could you say that again, Kyle? 
Yes, so we work with a specific uh, client up in Northumberland and they don't have black grass pressure, but they're thinking about the AB15 mix and what to uh, put in it. What would you suggest in that situation? Okay, so up in up in Northumberland, the other issue for them is obviously their winters tend to be colder for longer. Um, and the and the winter hardiness of many of the legume species is, you know, it, it, it's not as good as it as it could be. Um, and actually, I would probably use a grass based mix one up there to keep that cover in the ground. And it almost insulates some of the, the ten, more tender legumes by having the grass there. If you've only got the, the legumes on their own, they, they can be quite prone to, you know, frost kill and so on. Um, so I probably would use it. And I'd also say up in in Northumberland with, you know, more availability of livestock. Um, we've done some some sort of economic studies on the difference between the AB15 option, which is the legume and legume and grass mix, but you're not allowed to graze it. That the payment is higher because it's compensating you for not grazing it compared to GS4, which is the legume and herb rich grazing mix. So effectively you get 200 pounds a hectare more in stewardship to not graze it that's the that's the compensation but where you've got livestock available and infrastructure and that sort of thing we actually found that normally the the value of the grazing to the animals was well in excess of 200 pounds so you get the benefit of a better return and you get the benefit of more diversity because you're getting those animals into your system so personally, I would choose the GS4 option if he could and get get animals back into the system as well. But but otherwise, if he's just going for the AB15 because there's no fencing or no water or whatever, um, then I'd still probably in, in Northumberland, I would go for a mix which had some grass in it. And I'd, and I'd be careful about which of the legumes are in it as well, because some of them are much less likely to survive the winter up there. Hairy vetch is a good one. It's very, very winter hardy. But it's in an AB15, that's OK. It's not so good in a grazing situation. Thank you, Ian. A uh, bit of a different question from Georgina. Uh, we are on heavy clay soils and definitely seeing the positive impact of our diversity on what we're trying to achieve with better soils and more resilience. We do still have some fields that are quite problematic for slugs, though. What would be your solution as going to pellets every year just doesn't feel right? Uh, well, hi, Georgie. Um, certainly probably keeping brassicas down in your cover crop mixes would be something I would, would sort of focus on. They they tend not to help with, with slugs. Um, and also, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with the work that Colin is doing at NIAB around um, slugs and well, his main his work is on flea beetle, but they're certainly seeing that, as I say, that that very light surface cultivation seems to help a lot with slug numbers. Um, so in those early stages where you're trying to get the system back into some order, um, that can that can help. Um, hopefully, as the diversity builds up and the you know the beneficial insects and so on are increasing, then you know those slug numbers will come down. That's certainly what we're seeing. And you know, talking to people who've taken a view on things like not using insecticides under any circumstances um, they're starting to find that after a bit of pain and there's no doubt that there has been a bit of pain on some of those farms they are seeing that they simply don't need them anymore um, it's probably part of a wider system but you know they're getting to a point where these uh, natural predators are are playing their part but you know i know i know the soils on the farm there again it's it's fairly heavy soil there in cambridgeshire um, in that particular area anyway and um, you know, slugs are something that you don't want to make worse by building in lots and lots of uh, of brassicas and things into your system if you can. But um, it's difficult when they when you've already got the problem. Phacelia is one species that they don't seem to like, in my experience. I don't know what other people have found, but that's that's one thing that slugs don't seem to eat very much. Do you have problems with slugs in the US, Shane? We don't in my part of the world. I'll let Luke and Brian, they specifically deal with more row crop. 
I mean, they they can present themselves, but you know, as you said, Ian, it's there's there's kind of a little hump you got to get over if you do start to get them. If you just kind of hold true to you know not allowing uh, the use of a lot of insecticides and let some of those beneficial insects establish, you know, maybe get some more flowering species or have uh, more of a harbor for your beneficial insects to to be into, you, you, you can kind of control that. Um, we just don't have the issues with slugs, but I, I would say you made a good point about the brassicas too. It seems a lot of people are are very very heavy on their brassica rates. Um, I tend to pull them back. I, I in you know in our terms here, I do no more than a pound and a half per acre of any kind of brassica in a mix. And I thought it was kind of funny. We were in Ireland this year, and I was asking them on cover crop mixtures what they were using for. For brassicas, you know, what percentage of the mix was a brassica? Because I knew they were using some, and they specifically said, "Well, there, it's no percentage; it's 100%. You know, it's they're using all brassicas as a cover crop, and you know, it's too much of a good thing can be a bad thing there. So we try to limit our uses of brassicas anyway to, to help with that." <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not too tired. Located, so we don't, we don't tend to have slug issues. Uh, not serious ones anyway in this part of the world I you get in the northeast u.s and they do tend to struggle with slugs uh, where i mostly see it is kind of two, two three years in people first start to use cover crops and then the slugs show up and the again the predators aren't there yet so we just got to keep in mind that those predators need habitat one of the things i have seen was somewhat successful um, this was actually in france but they planted basically habitat strips on like 60 meter spacing. And, you know, there was a, a, a beetle that would live in that habitat that would eat feed on the slugs, but they could only travel so far. They'd come out at night and eat the slugs, but again, they have to have somewhere to go. So just keep in mind, if you want those beneficials, you need some habitat for them somewhere. There's Thanks everybody. A bit of work in the UK um, by an organisation called the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust on things called we call them beetle packs, and it's exactly what Brian's talking about, exactly that, and and they've shown how far things can go out into the field, um, but they they haven't proven very popular yet. Um, but uh, you know, perhaps perhaps when people, it's all part of a system. If you're if you're building beetle banks and still spraying insecticide, they won't work. <laughs> So it's yeah, you know, that's part of part of the mix. But one of the main places that we do see them working is where people are trying to encourage wild game, um, partridges, and, and so on. And and you absolutely see an effect next to those out into the field. Um, you know, they they certainly work very very well. Thanks, guys. Um, a, a question from Tom. I think it's a uh link to the to the uk us context again is life stay required where you guys are in the us or have you got reliable heavy frosts and managed successful crimping <clears throat> termination no, i'll address it first and let luke and brian <clears throat> it's obviously going to depend upon your plant species that that cover crop i showed being rolled down that was a warm season cover crop sorghum sedan millets the individual, I think, came back in and play, applied a herbicide, a little phosphate, just because even though the roller crimper was crimping at above ground biomass, the sorghum sedan revegetated with new leaf structure from the base of the plant. So we had to terminate it with a cover crop. We see a lot of success with our cereals, with our growing seasons, such as cereal rye, being able to utilize roller crimpers to terminate that. Basically, once it goes to pollination, antesis, before seed production, we, we can be pretty successful with roller crimpers with very limited herbicide usage. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. And I think it, it all depends on, too, what is in your mixture. Sometimes we have producers, um, let's say, like ahead of a corn crop or maize crop, you know, they're using like a, a rye triticale, uh, veg clover combination uh, early on if we want to somewhat terminate out the grasses we can come in with like a select uh type product that is just a grass specific only compound and then come back in either in crop or prior to planting uh, with like a 2,4-D sharpen uh dicamba type product and take care of those broadleaves just depends on what crop 
There is roundup is the easy button. I think most people are overdoing the rates. I think some of these cover crops is as lush and vegetative as they are, and it seems like they're a little easier to kill. And I think we can uh, greatly reduce our glyphosate rates uh, on some of these cover crop mixtures. But roller roller termination um, works, but you got like like Shane says, you got to let it get to maturity before you can really be effective on that. But um, it's, you know, it's not that we're we're anti. Um, herbicides either it's still a tool in the toolbox but hopefully we can start to reduce some of those herbicide uses by getting some good proper cover crop establishments um, and utilizing all tools in the toolbox to successfully take care of them yeah we have had have had some uh instances of really good weed control and people completely eliminating herbicide pass as well you know with rolling down a, a big heavy rye cover crop for example and getting really good weed suppression but that's that's kind of hit and miss people are still trying to refine that system but generally yeah we're still pretty reliant on glyphosate thanks everybody i think we've got probably about 10 minutes left Chris asks, I have concerned about the allopathic effect of, of using um, herbicides. Advice varies from spraying six weeks prior to sowing a new crop. Um, any further advice? Yeah, you need to just be careful about exactly which active ingredient you're talking about. And, and also the reason, the six, for example, the six weeks prior on heavy soil might well be to make sure that the crop is the cover crop is really dead and the soil is drying out a bit before you try and establish another crop in the spring and I, and I would I've got first-hand experience of getting that wrong <laughs> um, we we did a we did a trial on a farm not far from the office where we grazed off about five acres in the middle of the field with with some sheep and the plan was to um, spray off all the bit around it and compare the two well, before we managed to get the sprayer on the field, it rained so hard that we didn't get on the field to spray it for six weeks. And the bit where the, where the sheep grazed off was two tonnes a hectare better yield than the rest of the field. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't necessarily because the sheep added anything in particular, other than they just helped the, helped the soil to dry out and the seedbed was better when the, when the crop was trying to establish and not horrible, you know, fairly, fairly nasty like the rest of the field was. Um, also, there's a big difference between using glyphosate and using something like a product called Kylio, which is glyphosate and 2,4-D. Then, the, then the withholding period is much longer, Chris. Um, but we've certainly seen where we've we've literally sprayed off the, the field with the cover crop in on the same day that we've planted it, and even the day after we've planted it, and there hasn't been any problem with pure glyphosate in in that scenario um so but certainly two four sorry yeah adding two four d to that mix would, would make make a very big difference so yeah allopathic effect is is real in some cases i'm i'm sure um you know the the american guys have probably got some experience of that as well um <coughs> but certainly those multi-species crops and direct drilling into them with glyphosate I haven't seen any any issues at all we've had um I can remember the first time we did it, I had 35 farmers watching the drill in the field, drilling into this cover crop. It just looked wrong. That's the only word I can use for it. It looked like we were absolutely crazy people for trying to do it. And six weeks later, the crop was up in rows. It was clean as a whistle. It looked absolutely fantastic. So um, as I say, had much better results doing it in the autumn than we have in the spring, um, but, it, but it's worked really nicely. You know, you've yeah, got points. Yeah. Just, I know Luke's probably going to mention the same thing, but really pay attention to those herbicide, you know, residues. We do run into issues with that on, on particular operations. The, the worst yeah, ones labels. in the UK are things like DFF and clopyrrolid or Dow Shield on legumes in particular. Um, but those those are the ones we seem to have the biggest problems with. Um, am, amino pyrrolid and the various things that are in products like Astro Curb, um, things like that, they seem to hang around a lot. 
Yeah, very. I mean, you guys covered it all. The labels of the law. Uh, University of Missouri here has some, has some research um, as far as, you know, planning rotations and restrictions as far as certain herbicides. Uh, Don Huber's done some research uh, as far as even using Roundup in, in this system as far as timing on that too. But definitely anything, um, you know, that's got any kind of soil residual activity, definitely pay caution to to what the what the label says. The label's the law. Um, but, you know, like I said, there's some research out there that has some of that information out there readily available for you guys. Well, on that note, I think we'll we'll leave that there. Big big thanks to to Shane and to Ian and to the rest of the Understanding Ag team for yeah really insightful hour and a bit. Um, this was our uh, first webinar in our autumn and winter webinar series that's looking at how farms can increase regenerative practices on their farm. We've got our next one in January which will be all about agroforestry and how um, farms can integrate trees into a, a production uh, farming system. I will send you more details on that for email. So a big thanks to everyone again and have a lovely evening. Thanks.